Well, you know, speaking of stoppage time, um, it's probably just me because I'm impatient, but are you surprised that uh, the pace of action in terms of some of the bigger name free agents is uh, sort of moving at a plotting pace? Yeah, we as ugly as the lockout was last winter, we did get that great flurry of activity prior to, I think the lockout began on December 2nd as teams and players and agents tried to avoid that uncertainty and whatever the new uh, agreement was going to be. And we had that record amount of action in, in November and the first day of December. I, I think it was $1.9 billion in free agent deals were signed last November and a billion had never been reached in a month. And we almost got a, a kind of NFL or NBA style start to free agency that I think fans and you know, the general public, uh, they enjoyed the action. They, and I, I think it did benefit the sport early before the lockout last season as uh, fans knew that they could anticipate action. There's a lot of things happening. The media was focused on it as signing after signing happened. And now we're, this winter we're sort of back to the status quo which is you know the hot stove is usually at least in recent years a slow burn as players and agents uh, well scott boris is very comfortable waiting out the waiting for a market to develop and i think more and more often we've seen teams kind of try to squeeze the middle and lower tier of uh free agents by using the calendar against somebody and even waiting into to march to sign certain free agents i mean i remember being on the pirate speed when david freeze was still unsigned spring training camp i, I think it was like march 10th or something and he was still unsigned until the, the pirates finally took him off the market and it was it was kind of surreal because he was you know a world series hero a really productive player and i think he'd hit that you know <clears throat> excuse me magic age of 32 or 33 and teams being really aware of aging curves and uh not as interested in that mid-tier free agent. But, yeah, I, I think we're back to kind of that normal, what's become a normal slow pace to to baseball's winter. And I suppose it can be debated whether that's good or bad. But I, I do think last offseason was interesting where because of the lockout, there are these really uh, tight, for at least in baseball, relative terms, tight transaction windows when a lot of business was done. Yeah, I want to direct people to the score.com, or if you follow uh, Travis Salchik on Twitter, you can find the link really easy at Travis underscore Salchik, S A W C H I K. Because you touched on that, and you always have a good way of boiling a lot of information into a relatively short story. So I appreciate that, and I actually should follow your lesson because I'm the opposite way, I'm way too wordy for what I want to say, both some on radio. Of, some of my editors think, think believe I'm too worried, too. So. But, no, you, you pointed it out, and you're right, and it, it isn't that I've forgotten about it, but it was good to have that that lesson that there is a frenzy uh, in, like, in, in anticipation of the lockout. There, Like you pointed out, all these people signing left and right on Dece- December 1st. And then, of course, as soon as the lockout ended, we had a very quiet time before it ended obviously then there was another frenzy so you had like two different rounds of uh, frenzied activity and i i thought it was great for baseball and i thought it was really really exciting and that's one of the things in recent years about mlb that has been unfortunate when um you know they they've they've sort of they've sort of put these things into place like with the schedule like i never remember the gm meetings being so prominent uh, the winter meetings for sure. But it's like those meetings are now more about setting, uh, feeling out the other teams and finding out uh, just kind of kicking the tires and just maybe having a good conversation with a bunch of teams. Uh, it, and I hate to sound like the old timer because that's not my point here, but I remember like when the winter meetings were crazy. They were just insane. I mean, there's like trades, big trades being made. And now it's like, you know, everyone, those things are almost like obstacles. It's like, well, we'll have some more conversations at the next round of meetings. So the the Hot Stove League um, just sort of gets awfully cool and awfully quiet for, for too many stretches of, uh, of time. And that's why, to your point, uh, I thought last year no one wanted a lockout, obviously, but it actually did uh, spur some excitement. So it, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm sure when these things start to go down now, it'll it'll happen pretty quickly. The names 
uh, coming off the board. If you, um, I wanted to ask Travis Salchik this. If you were running a major league franchise and you you were given the green light from the owner that you could be pretty you could be exorbitant in terms of pursuing one of these free agent shortstops and money for the most part really isn't an object. Who would Travis Salchik sign as a free agent among this uh, really uh, really impressive uh, list of shortstops that are available? <laughs> Yeah, it's another. It's a great class, and the, it's really a golden era for the position when you look at uh, the offensive performance, especially uh, for the first time. Or I, for the first time, I think it was last year. As a position, anyways, it's been above league average offense for the last few years, which is a historic outlier, and it speaks to the talent and uh, that's available. And uh, I mean, if I had my pick, I. <laughs> that's a great question. I, mean, I Carlos Correa, I feel like he's never been bad, and he provides impact on both sides of the ball. Really good defender, great offensive player. I think he might be at the top of my list, but I think you can make arguments. Well, Trey Turner, I, I suppose I have to have him at the top of my list. I'm going through. You have Dansby Swanson. I'd put Turner. Let me take that back. I would go Turner, but Correa, I mean, it's a great class, and I wonder if Correa had to settle for that one-year deal or, or two-year deal with the player option he opted out of. I wonder if he's going to be in another situation where it's so deep he doesn't get the desired contract again. Uh, maybe he, there's a better value play in the group. But, yeah, Trey Turner, for what he brings, I guess you'd argue he's at the top of the class. But Correa's right there with him. It is, it's, a historic, it's a historic period for shortstop playing. We're seeing it in free agency. I wanted to ask you about catchers because that's a hot topic in St. Louis uh, with the Cardinals for the first time since the 1999 off season leading into 2000, the first time they're actually searching for a starting catcher. I mean, it's amazing to think about it in those terms, but it's true. They, they hadn't searched for a starting catcher since they took a flyer. Basically it was a really low budget contract on Mike Matheny before the 2000 season. That's how long it's been. So this is a, it's a pretty big opportunity for the Cardinals. And there are free agent catchers available. There are reportedly, you know, catchers, Sean Murphy, uh, the, the the two or three guys in Toronto. Uh, they're available. The free agent, Wilson Contreras, and then you have uh, Christian Vasquez, and, and there's others, of course. But I wanted to ask you um, a, a few things about this. First of all, what is your opinion of Wilson Contreras in terms of his defense? Because locally, he seems to be getting dinged a lot by folks. I'm not sure they maybe are on top of things. They Maybe he's a Cub. They don't like him. And I'm not proclaiming that he's great defensively. <laughs> but as I joke, uh, some of the people that here that don't want this to happen, they make it sound like it's a miracle if he actually catches a pitch thrown by a pitcher, you know. So it's been wildly overstated, but I wanted to go to you because you're credible to me very much so. What do you think of him defensively? Yeah, it's, I mean, in St. Louis it's tough because when you've had Yachty behind the plate there for all these years, uh, you, you become spoiled as a, a, a person watching and enjoying the ball club. And uh, certainly there's no one in this class that's going to rise to peak Yachty defensive ability. But I think, you know, with Wilson, his carrying tool, is his bat, and I think his defense is is good enough for the position. And I think you're right; it's probably it's overstated. How uh, I don't think it's a liability. I just don't think it's the strength that you ideally want behind the plate, and that St. Louis has enjoyed for so many years. I might prefer. You mentioned Toronto is loaded with so much catching talent. Uh, I might prefer to get a little young, to find a younger option in the position that can really grow with a staff with a team and be there for. You know, a really extended period. Uh, Sean Murphy, I know a lot of teams are interested in him too. So I might, uh, I mean, if you could get Gabriel Moreno, the the great young Blue Jays catcher who's got so much potential and behind the plate and as a switch hitter at the plate, I he'd be a top priority for me for a catcher needy club if you can pry him loose. Uh, so I I don't think, <laughs> excuse me, Contreras is a terrible defender, but I might prefer to trade market. 
Uh, but there's other teams looking for catchers too, so it'll be really interesting. I know Cleveland here has a big need at the position too. Uh, so yeah, that's something to watch. Do you? Um, I, I wanted to ask you about Sean Murphy because I must confess. I mean, sure, I do my homework and take a look at a, a lot of things about him just by going to fan graphs or uh, the catching metrics at baseball prospectus, where, wherever I may go. But in terms of actually watching him play a lot, I don't. Uh, he seems like an awfully good catcher uh, at both ends of things, you know, um, defense and offense. And I've noticed that when he does not hit at the ballpark in Oakland, his uh, his power numbers are fantastic. Um, he has a lot of appeal, but do you share that enthusiasm? I mean, do you, do you have a high opinion of him? Yeah, I think he'd be – a great upgrade for a number of contenders. And as you mentioned, he does it well in both. There's so much value in those two-way catchers, uh, what Yachty did for all those years. Uh, you know, I think about what Russell Martin did when the Pirates had that short window and they were good. They had Russ Martin behind the plate as a 400 on base guy at the plate and an elite defensive catcher. And Murphy brings some of that. And yeah, his power will play up even more once, once he leaves Oakland. Uh, so there's some, untapped hidden upside there too as a as a trade acquisition candidate and he's he's right there at the top of the trade list i don't know who the blue jays might be willing to part with but those look those are some of the top targets if you're looking to upgrade the position uh yeah and he's a fantastic player he might not be that well known because he's played in a small market on the west coast but he's a tremendous player and he'd be a worthy replacement for a molina or any you know any team looking for a an upgrade or that has a vacancy there. Yeah, the Cardinals obviously would have to pay a, a pretty pretty um, steep or just uh, generous price um, in, in terms of trade value to get them, but they are well-stocked with uh, young players and prospects, prospects. We'll see. I want to go back to Toronto. Our guest is our friend Travis Salchik from thescore.com, national baseball writer. Uh, Beside Moreno, you know, you have Danny Jansen, who's got two years left on his – two years left of club control, and then you have Alejandro Kirk, who's got four years of club control. And they're both intriguing, and I did a deep dive on them too. Um, do, you have, um, do you have a preference between those two just off the top of your head? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but do you like, <laughs> do you like one more than the other based on, you know, just watching them and – learning about them to the to the extent that you have? Uh, I I believe the Blue Jays uh, really love Kirk's bat and think he has a – they believe he's a legit middle-of-the-order bat. So I think I – I mean, Jansen's a quality catcher too who can, uh, who can help a lot of teams back there. But I just think Kirk's offensive upside is rare. And I think the Blue Jays value him – Maybe the most um, among that group, amongst that group. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would put him at the top of the list. But there's a they're one of the rare teams with this catching depth that's all at the major league level or major league ready. So they're in an interesting position to to make a deal. And after trading T. Oscar, whether they address their lineup or they they need a left-handed bat, they need they probably need more bullpen help. They're in an interesting position where they they're incentivized to make a trade and trade from that, that surplus they have. So uh, it is an interesting time to be asking that question. I prefer Kirk. I don't know about – I'd be curious to what, what you found from your deep dive, but that's who I would I would choose between the two. Well, the, the, the thing that jumped out at me, and I don't know what your opinion is on, like, catcher metrics. I, I you know, I uh, – I, you know, I, I think people trust StatCast. Uh, I appreciate the work that's put in by Baseball Prospectus, and they have a lot of detailed categories. The thing that jumped out at me was um, I, I don't know whether it is just one of those perceptions because of the way Kirk looks, his body type, or whatever it is, but that he, that he's somehow just a bad only. He's like, oh, he's not very good defensively. And I heard that a million times, and uh, people's like, well, he's, you know, he's, that dude is, that dude is big. He's, he's just, he doesn't move very well and all this stuff, just making stuff up basically. And everything that I did when I checked on him, cause I wanted to find out is like, I was surprised by 
if, especially if you go with if, if baseball perspectives as a credible source, uh, he's ranked very highly defensively. I mean, I was like, frankly, st- kind of stunned by it. And even now, yeah. you know, pe- people say they dismiss him like abruptly as, as, as a, a catcher who can play good defense, which I don't know. I, I think it is kind of like body shaming or something. I don't know what it is because the numbers say he's really good. Yeah, I think because of that, he's probably been, been unfairly dang because of just physical, doesn't have the traditional build you're looking for. Uh, but yeah, he grades out <laughs> well. And again, the, the bat is just, you, you just don't see guys with that kind of potential to barrel up baseballs like he he does. That's just a separator for me. Uh, I don't know if you could bribe him loose, but yeah, he's, a, he's a really interesting player. And uh, I mean, I, the defensive side of the catching position, I I think there's a lot of value in the metrics. Uh, the the framing value is real; it has a huge impact. And if I mean the difference between a one-two and a two-one count is dramatic. It's like 300 points of batting average. So if you have a, pit, a catcher like Yadi who's been really good at stealing those strikes over the years, it provides tremendous value. And I think there's a lot of value that we don't even we know it has some importance, but we can't measure it. Whether it's reading a batter swing, how he's taking a pitch, working with a staff, the sequencing of pitch calls. I think all that has – I think catching defense is even more valuable than we know or that we ascribe value to because uh, there's there's just so much there. So, I, I'm, uh, so yeah, I think – I don't know if Kirk brings all that to, to the table, but I think uh, defensively he's, he had surprising value in the bat is special. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's tough to replace Yachty. But it, there's worse places to look than, than what the Blue Jays have in the roster. Travis, I got one more for you, sir. Uh, just your thoughts on Cody Bellinger, uh, the the potential for a pretty uh, strong bounce back offensively, and uh, noting that he actually did improve, not by a little amount, uh, last season, even though the final numbers weren't impressive, it, still much better than they were two years ago. So – What's your assessment of him? Yeah, I'm actually writing a piece about Bellinger this week. Oh, so that's uh, that's a promote that here. But, I can't wait. Yeah, he's uh, he's one of the most intriguing players of the off season. I feel you look at those age 21, 22, 23 seasons. He was there's very few major league hitters who have ever played that well at such a young age, and of that group of hitters who perform like Bellinger at that young age, no one has fallen off in performance like him in, in baseball history. So where he goes from there is uh, is fascinating. And, and of course, he's not just a bat. I mean, he's a good athlete who plays a, a really capable center field uh, and can move around the, the field. So I would, if I'm an executive, he's definitely a player I'd like to, uh, I wouldn't necessarily want to build my lineup around him by any means, but to take a shot and believe that he hasn't forgotten how to play baseball, that he had a serious injury that shoulders can be difficult to come back from. And I'm sure that's lingered and maybe there's some confidence issues that sprung from that, but I can't believe such a talented player has completely forgotten how to hit at age 27. So uh, I'm, I'm definitely buying on a short term deal and believing he, he can get closer to what he was. I don't know if he'll get all the way back in 2023, but I just, He's, he's so talented. That swing was so special. I just can't believe he completely, completely lost it. Yeah, I'm, and, uh, I'm with you. Oh, one I'm other with thing you. about, <laughs> and oh, one other thing about the catching position is the other real wild card. If you're making long term bets here, what if there's an automated strike zone and all of a That's sudden right. the trimming value is just gone <laughs> overnight? So I don't even, as an executive, if you're how, how do you make a long term decision at the position? <laughs> you don't even know what the rules might be in three years. So, but. uh yeah, I just I forgot I wanted to to mention that, but uh, yeah, as far as yeah. Bellinger, definitely a guy I'd want to bet on if I'm if I'm you know in a front office this winter. Travis Sawchick, uh, thank you, and I hope you, you and your loved ones had a, a good Thanksgiving and happy holidays to you. I, I doubt that we'll talk uh, talk to you before uh, Christmas, but you never know. But it, it just wanted to extend those wishes to you anyway. Now that. Since since we have you on the phone, I always appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, uh, same to you, sir. Uh, and if 
need me before the Christmas, feel free to reach out. <laughs> I will after the Cardinals make that Sean Murphy trade. So <laughs> that's <laughs> we'll right. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's Take our care. friend Travis Sawchick from thescore.com. You ought to go to thescore.com, by the way, if you haven't. I mean, it's um, uh, they cover everything. And one one thing I, I mean, I like a lot about it, but one thing I really like about it is, like, if you want to get caught up on what's happening in sports and just, you know, maybe you don't follow the NBA that much, but if you just want to, you heard something and you're like, oh, I want to see what that was all about. Man, they're they just bang out pieces so quick, and they're short. They're easy reads. They don't take a lot of your time. And then they will have deeper pieces written by our guest, uh, Travis Salchik, where, you know, he's very, very good about sort of like writing about issues and writing about uh, play, you know, the, uh, uh, the way the game's played, you know, some of the new rules changes. I mean, he does deep dives on everything, and he's got a really good, uh, really good touch and feel for evaluating uh, free agents or trade uh, trade possibilities. So he's I, I, I would recommend reading him. But the score dot com is uh, very underrated. So they're uh, they're really valuable when I don't feel like, you know, maybe it's later at night. I want to get caught up really quick, but I don't necessarily want to read for an hour. You know, I just want to kind of like uh, graze, if that's the term. Try that with the score, the score dot com. It's well organized and uh, you can find out things quickly 